Greetings, everyone. Good morning, and, and thank you for coming to uh, our most recent of the 2017-2018 University Colloquium Series engagements on We Have Ag. Uh, and today's uh, topic is water quality is our agriculture rich in our agriculture rich region. Uh, challenges and opportunities. I'd like to thank you for coming. I'd like to thank our panelists uh, for taking time out of their busy days. I'd like to thank all of you because I know how busy you are uh, in your days uh, for taking the time and, uh, and, and giving the interest to a very interesting uh, panel discussion that we have here. Uh, and uh, today our distinguished group of panelists uh, is going to be introduced by Kimberly Musser, uh, who is our director of our Water Resources Center. Uh, and before I, I ask uh, Kimberly to come up and introduce our panelists, uh, I would like to uh, give you the, let you know that we're going to give you an opportunity uh, to ask questions uh, at the end of the presentations. Uh, and we have found throughout the course of the colloquium series uh, that it's been very interactive, very engaging, uh, and each one of these series has had its own unique, uh, its own, its own unique uh, brand to it. Uh, and today's uh, is, is a very interesting discussion uh, and, uh, and, and we, we look at uh, the water quality as something that's important to all of us. Uh, and we're going to learn a lot about water quality, water quality in the region, and how important it is uh, to uh, how we live the quality of life uh, and uh, the food that we, we eat. Uh, and with not much further ado, I will ask Kimberly to come up uh, and introduce our panelists. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So I'll introduce our panelists in order of when they will be telling their stories. The first speakers will be Don and Becky Wiskuski, and they'll be telling the story about the impacts of increased flow that they're experiencing around their home. And we'll share a video with you for that one. The second speaker will be Pat Baskild, from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. He's a hydrologist, and he'll be talking about regional water quality issues. <laughs> Our third group of speakers will be um, Jessica Nelson from the Lesur River Watershed Network and the Water Resources Center here at MSU. And she's gonna be talking about the citizen-led solutions in the Lesur River Watershed. And the final presentation will be by Dusty Anderson and me talking about the work that we've been doing in the Watt and Wan River Watershed, working with citizens and developing strategies for improved watershed health in that watershed. So the first thing that we would like to share with you is a film that depicts, it shows Don and Becky telling the story of what's happening in their neighborhood. Hi there, welcome to our neighborhood. We're Dr. Becky and we live on the Lisa River. We have a story, and as we moved out here, uh, we started to see that there were some issues with our river, starting to, uh, starting to disappear. And over the course of the years, we've had a lot uh, here on the river. In the 1970s, this neighborhood was starting to grow out here, and these houses were going. And we had a hundred foot setback from the edge of the river, river bank. And right now, behind my deck, I've got about six feet. So in that time frame, we have lost a considerable amount of backyard. Since 2010, when the first big event hit, we lost about 30 feet in just a couple of days. So it tells you how fast this river comes up after a major rain event. Hi, I'm Brooke Cochran, and I work with the Department of Natural Resources, the Division of Ecological and Water Resources. And I work on a three-person team that studies uh, 
Can all physical conditions of the rivers and streams throughout the Lassoon watershed and throughout southern Minnesota, so we can understand how, how our rivers are changing and the relationship with flow and with land use. The example that John and Becky talked about is not just something that we're seeing in certain areas, it's something that's happening throughout the watershed, and we're seeing this channel instability, more erosive channels, less connection to the floodplain, and incision and widening. And so I'm part of this team that's looking at and measuring um, with our survey here. We have at least 20 sites in the Latour where we are surveying the reaches so we can understand how the rivers are changing. And then we um, also have hydrologists that are looking at how the flow is changing. And uh, we are working with our local partners, both um, local government units, landowners, state agencies, university partners, so that we can come up with watershed solutions um, so that we can improve the health of the land and the water. Roughly within the past six years, flow in the Lusuru River has about doubled. And so with that, we see changes to the form and the shape of the channel. And then with that, we have impacts to water quality, more sediment. Um, it impacts the habitat for the aquatic organisms and also the infrastructure um, as this, this river takes on its new form and changes its pattern. And therefore, we're working with others to try to come up with uh, solutions where we can all store more water on the landscape um, with such things like um, wetland restoration, more perennials, um, cover crops, um, floodplain reconnection and restoration in appropriate areas. And this has been um, a really engaging and interesting, and I think we're moving in the right direction in the conversations we're having, especially with the Lisa River Washing Network. We're very concerned not only about um, the loss of our property, but also we're trying to preserve the neighborhood that we live in. Uh, we're concerned about the amount of sediment that's going into the river, how we've seen the river change over the years. Uh, from a gentle little river to a roaring, destructive river. And it impacts us, it impacts everyone. Uh, not only in the quality of the water for, for drinking, for recreation, for farmers losing their, losing their land into the river, we're help, trying to help to find ways that we can slow down the river, that we can, so that it doesn't come so fast after it rains. That's where we see the destruction. And we'll see it uh, rain and the next year the river is up overnight. This is just an example because there's people on the river uh, all the way up and down that have lost land, uh, farmers have lost uh, production because of the the loss of their land, and I think this is an example of problems that have been directly affected by loss of the land. This is our this is our home. This is our home. The river runs through us, and we are so passionate and dedicated to having something done to help not only save our home, other people's homes but also to save this beautiful river that we call So I just, we're really excited. We just finished this video, and thank you to all the film stars in the video. And we also, I wanted to give a shout out to the drone pilots are both here, so Tyler Group and Rick Moore. So thanks for uh, allowing us to use that incredible footage. And thank you to Tyler uh, Grupa from the Water Resources Center at MSU, and also to Josh Coimene, who's a film student here, who did a lot of work with the editing. So um, just wanted to give that shout out and thank yous about the film. So I don't know if Don and Becky, Becky, if you'd like to add anything at this point, or we'll also be talking about the work of the Lesur River Watershed Network um, shortly. Do you want to yeah. um, as we watch the video, <clears throat> it just brings up those emotions again of what we've been through since we moved out there and, and uh, how, how we've worked so hard and we've worked with so many agencies to try to get 
answers to get something done and, and the frustrations, it's just, you can't hardly put it into words. Um, we see a lot of, there's help for the infrastructure for uh, the public land, but when it comes to private landowners is where we see it stops. <coughs> And there's and so that's why we're just so passionate about continuing to fight because, like Don said and we've said that we're not the only ones that are impacted by this. There's countless people that are in the same situation as us. We have nowhere to turn. We have no one that is out there to help that will help provide the funding for us to do something to save to save our riverbank. So we continue um, to have hope because we have to, that we will get something done. And we raise our voices because it's the right thing to do. We have uh, joined the Lesur River Watershed Network about four to five years ago uh, for the simple fact that something has to be done by someone. And it's a grassroots organization that uh, Kim and Jessica got uh, started and we can actually see that we're getting something done. Uh, Ditch 48 over in Wasik County is a, is a good example. We wanted to put in a larger pipe, which means larger pipe puts more water into the river quicker. And uh, after some negotiation, litigation, or not litigation, but uh, talking to the commissioners and or the landowners, uh, they Finally, it sounds like they're going to back off of that. Uh, but we want to just show that you can't rubber stamp these things anymore. Something has to be done because the land going off, or the water going off the land has to go someplace and it directly affects people that live downstream from uh, their pipe going into the river. So. A lot of people ask us when they see our situation, they say, well, why did you build on the river? Well, when these, this neighborhood was established back in the 70s, we had 100 feet behind. 100 foot there was no thought whatsoever that there could ever be anything like this, or it would have not have been approved. Um, so we didn't build on the river. We're, we're put in a situation that has been caused by a lot of other things, we didn't cause it, but we get that question a lot. Mm -hmm. We have been working, we moved out there in 04, and in 05, we figured that something has to get done, so we worked with uh, Soil and Water and other agencies, and Soil and Water actually, uh, the Clean Water Legacy Act, enabled us to put a towwood project in, which is basically an artificial floodplain, which uh, slows the power of the water down as it re before it reaches the bank. And that was put in, unfortunately, uh, after the 10 flood, which we lost a lot of land behind the house, and as well as Dave's house, that one you saw in the movie. And uh, it went in in 11, and we had, again, a one in 14, which damaged the one at by Dave's place. And ours was intact. And when 16 came, so, pardon me. Uh, the only thing that saved our house, I believe, was that tow that was put behind. And it, um, it served its purpose. But now we have an issue, like my wife was saying, that we need to have the bank armored um, because of the fact that if we don't, the, the neighborhood is going to be gone eventually. So we're working toward that. And we've met with state agencies, federal agencies, uh, up in St. Paul. And uh, of course, there's not much money for public or private land as opposed to public. So we're still fighting that battle. There, there have been three projects that have been done on our, on the curve right before our property. Uh, one was done, and they were, they were all to armor the wall to the road coming into our neighborhood. So they've protected, through uh, the Army Corps of Engineers and NRCS, 
three separate projects have been done to protect the road coming into our property. The road's good, but where our land starts, there's nothing. And that's where all of the erosion takes place because everything else is armored up to that place and we take the full impact of it coming the out. The NRCS ended that rock wall at my property line. And in the video, if you look behind Brooke, there was a uh, gravel bar behind her. The edge, the far edge of that gravel bar was where the original river bank was. And that is obviously now gone. And we had a gentleman out there that um, figures out how much property is there is there because it's his job as he's uh, president of dirt merchants in Mankato and he estimated just behind Dave's place 31,000 cubic yards of sediment have been uh, put into the river since 09 so you can see why they're having problems in Lake Pepin and where the Minnesota meets uh, the, uh, the Mississippi up in St. Paul. So if something has to be done, it just cannot be same old, same old. So for our next speaker, we asked uh, Pat Bassfield, who's from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, to contextualize what's happening in the Lesua River with regional water quality issues. So, Pat. So where's the, the time at this time? Hmm. Now we're good? All right. Okay. Now we're down to seven minutes. All right. Um, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, I guess, still. Um, like Kim said, my name is Pat Bassfield. I'm a can you hear me okay, or, or should I should I use this, or we good? It's, it's okay. Okay. Well, I, I let me try it without uh, standing in front of the computer. But anyways, I'm a hydrologist with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and my job I oversee. Uh, a program called the Watershed Pollutant Load Monitoring Network, or I'm the program coordinator for that, and that's a statewide river monitoring program. So today what I'm gonna do is not talk so much about the program, but talk about some of the water quality results that we've collected uh, over time. We started this program back in 2007. Uh, 2008, we received um, um, clean water legacy funding through the Clean Water Fund. Um, and we've been monitoring ever since. We, we collect uh, 25 to 35 samples a year. We have 199 monitoring sites. And the pollutants that we monitor uh, for are, include sediment, nitrogen, and phosphorus. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail on the, the detriments of these, but, but sediment, uh, aesthetically, it's unappealing. And, and uh, both benthic communities and any uh, aquatic community, um, fish, uh, uh, other organisms, they're certainly affected by sediment. Phosphorus, it's the limiting nutrients in our freshwater systems. We have enough of everything typically to grow algae, except for phosphorus. You put in more phosphorus, you get bad algae blooms. Nitrogen, kind of the same thing. There's, there's health problems or, uh, with nitrogen and, and also in marine environments. Um, it's uh, uh, known to produce excess algae. That algae, when it dies, causes uh, oxygen shortages, fish kills, etc. Okay, uh, what I'm going to do, I, I get a lot of questions. What is the water quality like in this area? Has it gotten better? And so what I did with this presentation, and I, I did create this um, uh, at, at an earlier date, and, and but a lot of it is applicable. Uh, this was primarily for the Watton River watershed, but we can easily expand this to the greater Blue Earth River watershed, which includes the Watton, Blue Earth, and Lesueur. 
So the, the first question um, that I'm going to, we'll take a look at is, uh, what is the quality of the water throughout Minnesota? So we'll take a, a large view. Uh, these are maps. Uh, these are uh, color-coded watersheds. These are, are watersheds. They're a size of uh, oh, 500 to 700 square miles. They're eight-digit Huck watersheds, hydrologic unit code, if that means anything to, to any of you. But we used stoplight colors showing showing good water quality, red being the poorest water quality, and, and these are uh, our map showing a statistic called the flow rate of mean concentration. So this is the volumetric average. This is like taking all of the water that came through the Watt and River watershed, stirring it up, grabbing one sample. That rep sample represents the overall quality of the water. So what's great about this statistic is we can compare, these watersheds are obviously different sizes, but we can compare the quality of the water equally across all of these watersheds. So uh, looking at these maps, we've got sediment on the left, phosphorus in the middle, uh, nitrate and nitrogen on the far right, and you can see some, some definite patterns here. Um, if we look at the north, you know, the central, north central, and northeast parts of the state for all three of these parameters, we have pretty good water quality. You know, in fact, really good water quality, and as Minnesotans, that uh, should come as no surprise to you. But if we move to the western part of the state, and then head south, you see kind of what we call the Fertile Crescent. Um, you know, we'll see more impaired water qualities up in the Red River Basin. As we come south into the Minnesota River Basin, we see that. And then as we move to the southeast, uh, that holds true as well. And, and the patterns are similar for both sediment and phosphorus. Nitrate, nitrogen, if you look at the Red River Basin, so the northwest part of the state, um, that was impaired for sediment and phosphorus, or those watersheds are impaired. Nitrogen, not so much. They don't have the subsurface tile. So as such, by the time that water that infiltrates makes it to the river, the nitrogen is lost. So that's the, the, the primary difference. And if we look at land use or percent land disturbance, you can see that certainly we have some correlations with water quality. Um, if we look at land use, the map on the left, uh, yellow is crop lands. Um, dark green is, is uh, or the greens are forest and shrubland, and, and red is metro. And if you look at, you know, so you can see the, you know, the, the, the land use definitely uh, correlates with water quality. But that's also where the last glacier came through. So we do have younger, more fertile soils. Um, and if we look at percent land disturbance, of course, with the young fertile soils, we want to farm those. So where all the red is, that's, that's all farmland. And, and certainly they are the best soils for growing crops. So what do we know? Uh, number one, we know that streams and rivers within areas of the state with the most fertile soils soils and most disturbed landscapes have the most impaired water quality. How, uh, how am I doing, Kim? We, what? Okay, all right, okay. So uh, now I'm going to bring it in to give kind of a local perspective. You know, what is the water quality like in this area? And I've got a series of pictures. I live on the Watton River. I uh, spent a great deal of time on it. I uh, fish it quite a bit. And, and the water quality in, from a local standpoint, it, it, it depends. You know, it depends on what happens prior to your going down the river. If you get a hard rain, it can be horrible, and there are times in the fall time it can be, it can be great, or later in the summer. Uh, this is a prime example. This is one of my favorite fishing spots. You can see a nice sandbar on the left-hand side here. This is the same location. Uh, this is after a high intensity rain. This is in August. At this time, uh, when this picture was taken, uh, Medelia didn't treat their sewage very well. Uh, Tony Downs treatment plant was in town. There was a lot of, lot of fats and, and, and just other things that went to the river. I'd wait in the river and I could actually feel it on my skin. I'd be sticky when I got out. But they did upgrade the plant. That did take care of this, this floating algae on top. Um, to give an idea of the water quality in our area, I like to use these maps. We call these our lock and dam number three maps. And what we, we did with, uh, with these maps, we took our furthest downstream sites on both the, on the, um, the St. Croix, uh, the upper Mississippi above the cities, 
and uh, on the Minnesota River. So we look at Minnesota River at Fort Snelling. And what we do is we, we've taken the average pollutant loads that uh, we've calculated at all these sites, and we divide these by the load at lock and dam number three, which is the first downstream sampling location after all three of these branches come together. So it gives us kind of a relative feel for how much of that lock and dam number three load came from each one of these you know, upper sites, the St. Croix, Mississippi, or the Minnesota River. And certainly between these locations, there's you know sediment that settles out and sediment that gets picked up. So the numbers aren't completely additive, but they're pretty darn close. You can get a general feel for, for where the problem areas are. And in, with this map, um, one thing I want to point out, if you take a look at the Minnesota River at Fort Snelling, that's the equivalent, that load, average load, is the equivalent of 78% of the sediment load measured at Lac and Dam number three. So we can see that, uh, you know, if we look at this map, uh, Upper Miss, 20%, uh, St. Croix, kind of a non-factor, 5%, and that's before Lake St. Croix. Um, so we actually get less sediment coming out of the St. Croix River Basin that, than that 5%. But we can see we have a disproportionate amount coming from the Minnesota River Basin. Um, if you look at the, to the right of this graph, 78% uh, of the sediment, 72% of the nitrate nitrogen, 55% of the phosphorus, <coughs> that equivalent comes from the Minnesota River Basin. And this, this gets a little complex, um, so I'm just gonna just kind of give you the highlight of this. What I, I did the same thing for basically the greater Blue Earth River Basin. If you look at, on the right-hand side of this slide, I've got the Lesseur River Basin, that's 26%. Uh, Blue Earth River uh, at Rapidan, 25%. Watt Juan, 4%. So those loads divided by that Lac and Dam number three load gives us those percentages. So we can see coming from the greater Blue Earth, that includes the Blue Earth, Lesseur, and Watt Juan, we have the equivalent of 55% of the Lac and Dam number three sediment load. That's huge. And uh, at the very top of this, I, I did the same thing with nitrate and phosphorus, and we see uh, the equivalent of 30% of the lock and dam number three load for nitrate, nitrogen coming out of the greater blue earth, 22% for phosphorus. So what we know number two, um, a uh, great deal of the pollutants reaching Lake Pepin originate from the Minnesota River Basin with a vastly disproportionate contribution from the blue earth and the sewer river watersheds. Uh, one last thing I forgot to mention with those, uh, it's only 7.5% of the drainage area at Lac and Dam number three. Uh, when does the pollution go through our rivers? Uh, March through June, basically. It's kind of that, and this is statewide, it's that open canopy period uh, climate. We have a more active climate during that time period. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry. <coughs> and these are, <coughs> excuse me, these are monthly pollutant loads here, these, these bars. But we can see 75%, uh, this is for the watt and watt of, of total suspended solids, comes through in the, March through, uh, the months of March through June. I put uh, the percentage of the total annual flow volume that comes through uh, for each month for the same site. And you can see this is also when most of the water goes through these systems. So we know on average uh, approximately 75% of the pollutant loads go through the Blue Earth River system uh, between the months of March and June. And I'll, I, I'll speed this up pretty quick, or, or speed this along, but uh, where does the sediment come from that enters our rivers? Um, I've got a video here, but I don't have enough time to show it. Uh, but we've, we've got overland flow. We have ravines. We've got a series of pictures. Uh, this is the head of a ravine. We went out, again, I forget what year this was, but we had uh, at the head of this ravine, at, at the time we took this, it's subsurface flow that's uh, feeding the system. The water's pretty clear. You can see I'm holding a container of water. Uh, TSS concentration, I think it was like 50 milligrams a liter from that sample. We went down, not even midpoint in this ravine. Sorry, this picture is pretty cruddy. But our TSS concentration, our sediment concentration, had gone up to 259 milligrams a liter. And if we get to the outlet, and this is actually later in the day when flows had picked up, but uh, when we were doing that series of grabbing samples, we were up to 1,200 milligrams a liter. We came out later in the day, and I think this was close to 6,000 milligrams a liter. So ravines uh, can really kick in a lot of sediments. And 
and we have a lot of stream bank and, and bluff erosion as well from the increased flows. Uh, tons and tons of tiling have gone on um, in the past uh, 15 years in these systems. Um, and, and certainly, um, I, I see it on the, the river I live on and all the other ones down here. So we know that the major sources of sediment in the Blue Earth River and its tributaries are from stream banks, ravines, gullies, and field erosion. Um, and I've, I've got, well, this is an easy one to explain. For nitrate nitrogen, if you look at the bottom graph, um, the, the dark uh, line that goes up and down, that's flow. The, uh, the, the green bars, and you can't really see them, they're purple bars, the, the vertical ones, those are concentrations. But I want you to see, uh, if we look at that lower graph, basically we're seeing during the summer, during that four month time period, that March through uh, end of June time period, those concentrations are, are, are relatively stable. You know, they, they fluctuate between about 9 and 11 milligrams a liter. Um, and if we go to that top graph, those are daily loads, and we can see that basically with nitrate nitrogen, because the concentrations don't change much during this, this open water season or when most of the flow is going down, we see that's when the load's coming through. So when we have water going down the system, basically, we have nitrogen going down, down the system. Phosphorus, Less so. It's more uh, phosphorus when we get storms. Um, we get a lot of overland erosion, ravine erosion. We see early on in the major events, um, we can see if we look at the, the bottom graph, uh, the one major event, we can see we have some pretty high concentrations early on, and then those concentrations fall. And that's when we find the loads, is we'll find you know, these, these loads at the beginning of this, these big events, and then they fall off over time. So I, I know those graphs didn't do much explaining those dynamics, but uh, what we know, number five, the major source of nitrate nitrogen to the greater Blue Earth River system is from agricultural fields uh, delivered via, via subsurface drainage. Uh, both point and non-point sources contribute to phosphorus to the Blue Earth River system. Non-point uh, or agriculture sources appear to be dominant, um, and I don't have enough time to go into details. And so I haven't shown a very good picture, but but I've been down here for 20 some years. I've spent a lot of time down here, and and things have gotten better and they've gotten worse. You know, it's we've never drawn a line in the sand. Uh, we've gotten better uh, with with residue. There's a lot of crop residue that's reduced erosion, conservation tillage methods, uh, applying fertilizer. Uh, uh, the agricultural community has gotten much more uh, detailed in in applying less, but in in you know more specific zones. Um, We've seen a lot of crap, a lot of erodible land, uh, CRP, that's been retired. Uh, there's been some really good things going on in the landscape. And why should we care? I, like I said, I spent a lot of time on these rivers, but uh, you know, we're, we take two steps forward, one step backwards, and it's a shame because you know, these pictures, if you take a look at, uh, you know, they're my kids, you know, I, I've never taken a picture of a kid on a river that wasn't smiling. Well, one time, that was the trip from hell that my, my daughter will tell you about someday. But, uh, so, but except for that one time, everybody's always smiling. So I, I know I've, I've kind of overdone my, my eight minutes here, but uh, that was musky out of the Blue Earth River. A buddy of mine caught this. We were kayak fishing. We were fishing out of our kayaks. But anyways, rivers, they are... Uh, I, I spend a lot of time outside. They are the best resources down here by, by long shot. They're, they're just fabulous. So, so you, you guys are passionate about the river, and so am I. I see a lot of stuff that, uh, that, that, that shouldn't happen but does, and we are making some progress, but we've got a ways to go. So, All right, Kim. Eight and a half minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. So Pat's laid the groundwork with some of the issues that we have to solve in this region. The next two group speakers are going to be talking about some solution strategies that uh, citizens of the Lesur River Watershed Network have been working on and then we'll also talk about the Watton One next. So next up is Jessica Nelson and she's a staff member here at the Water Resources Center and she's also leading the charge of this very inspiring group of citizens in the Lesur River Watershed Network. Thank you, Kim. Um, so I'm going to kind of describe a little bit about the journey that we've gone through um, 
kind of defining citizen-led solutions when the current systems and laws aren't helping people anymore and how can we raise awareness about that and help ourselves has been um, kind of our operating, what we've been operating under. Uh, to give a little geographical background, uh, Pat already you did a great job at showing us where we are, but I'll just reiterate. Um, the Sioux River watershed is a Huckate scale and it drains about 711,000 acres. It spans from uh, City of Freeborn, Heartland, and Freeborn County up near uh, Lake Elysian in Wasika parts of Mankato and down to Winnebago area. So it's a big spot, a big chunk of land that we're trying to tackle and um, slow the flow in. And so um, we kind of started off by kicking off with the mat party and just get people there, orienting themselves. We don't every day think about what watershed am I driving in or living in or eating out in. We just kind of pass the river and think it's pretty. So just get ourselves oriented and talking about, um, once you get a map down in front of people, it's like, oh, I'm up here and I'm down here and kind of see how we impact each other and get upstreamers and downstreamers talking. Um, followed by that, we had a series of six citizen advisory committee meetings in 2013 to kind of define our seven recommendations to cleaner water and river health, and that's really been what's driving us uh, since 2013. And I'll go into detail about those. And then in 2014, our steering committee was formed of about eight people. We've been kind of amoebic where more people actually have been joining the group and we've getting a little bigger and a little bigger as we kind of continue on. Um, we meet about bi-monthly to plan meetings, help each other with our sub-watersheds that we're working in and provide advice and just kind of get feedback of how do we get folks better organized around um, watershed topics and getting more water storage out on the landscape. Um, so these are our seven recommendations and uh, I'll just read through them real quick because it might be hard to read. So number one is more stormwater management and more in-ditch storage. Um, Number two is more experimentation and demonstration with temporary water storage. So like constructed wetlands or um, kind of surge ponds or depending on what landscape you're in. And then more strategically placed buffers, terraces, grass waterways, and then more communication, education among watershed residents. Cutting some of that red tape um, and helping landowners get assistance for their land management needs. Uh, more river channel maintenance of major snags, and then more stream bank sta and ravine stabilization for areas like Don and Becky's land. Um, so that's what's driving us. And now here's another picture of the map, and these are the the places in yellow are our priority sub watersheds um, that our steering committee members are working in. Uh, Don and Becky are in this watershed right up here in Blue Earth County, and so kind of their challenges up there are different than some of the watersheds down in the southeast area, and so we see a lot of those. Um, it's like the Nick zone, and so there is rapidly eroding. It's kind of a young river, and it has a huge drop, and so it, when you get all those flows, it's like a snake and kind of wants to wriggle around and uh, destabilize some of the more silty uh, soils out there. And so hopefully I'm explaining it. <laughs> um, that's just kind of how I see it, I guess, how I interpret it as so like a snake um, and eats away at the land. And then um, in this system right here, our, one of our steering committees, Gene Shefford, uh, he has, they started a ditch improvement and repair project in Wasika County, Ditch 19, and Farm America's in that ditch as well, and Gene introduced the idea of water storage, and it wasn't a part of the conversation until he brought in some maps and some folks, um, we showed some maps of where potential water storage opportunities could go, and it kicked the d direction from the kind of typical process of put in a bigger pipe to improve drainage and um, get the water off the land faster to, well, hey, there are these parts of our property that would benefit from a wetland restoration or more pollinator habitat for perennial cover and build up the soil health. Um, so it's just sometimes we get stuck in these routines and having people there to keep pushing these alternatives has been very impactful. Um, and then also, 
can show, let's see, City of New Richland's an area we're working in, and I'll got some pictures that'll pop up, and then Freeborn Lake has impaired lake down there, and so working with them and the DNR and Ducks Unlimited with a lake reclamation project, and then some opportunities upland to reduce uh, the amount of water or pollutants going into the lake. Um, so just some pictures, that one went away. Uh, so. A lot of history in Minnesota River Valley with flooding, and so a lot of that water is coming from the Lassure and slowing the flow before it hits. Uh, let's see, this is a picture from uh, St. Clair in 2010, right up here, and some of the flooding. They've encountered a lot of homes underwater, basement damage, and um, the post office was threatened, as well as, let's see. Uh, city of New Richland, right down here. This is a community we work closely with, and they have continual flooding. They had to evacuate their care center because of the water was getting so close, and um, sandbag along the roads in 2010 and 2016. And also, in a not typically wet year, this is a piece of land, um, a soybean field in September of 2015, and it's underwater, and they have a pump. Uh, the ditch system, if you guys can see, it's right over here. This is the pump system to get all this water off of the soybean field. And so this might be, it's a real little piece of land and maybe there's some other opportunities that we could use it for to temporarily store the water. Um, so being just more efficient. And this is from in Wasika County, September of 2016. We're having infrastructure costs where bridges are just blown out because of the quantity of water going down the system at one time. Um, and we also have uh, the Lower Minnesota River Watershed District. They spend hundreds of thousands of dollars dredging out uh, the Minnesota River to make it passable for um, boats to go through there. And there's also Lake Pepin that's filling in at a faster rate because of the sediment and the amount of water flowing through. Um, so we have all these challenges and problems of how do we do it and bringing it back to citizen-led solutions. Having the US Army Corps of Engineers or the DNR or someone come in saying, these are the, what you need to do isn't getting us very far. And so working with people that live on the land that knows how, um, what solutions are gonna serve them best is what we're trying to do, is break the barriers between um, people living and then the people who are planning and finding money to help support those solutions. Um, I'm probably running out of time a little bit, but here's another map of kind of the lay of the land and the communities. They're not very big populations. Um, a lot of it's corn and soybeans. The, that's what's depicted, the yellow is corn and green is soybean landscape. Um, and we have uh, the blue is streams and then these yellow segments are altered water courses. And so they, there's a lot of drainage happening and not a lot of places for water to be temporarily stored when we get those 100, 500 year rain events. Um, so we wanna see more things like this to provide the temporary water storage and in-ditch um, storage practices and more tillage out on the land with cover crops in there, um, wetland areas, big retention basins. Here's some more tillage, and this is a project out uh, Blue Earth County, Ditch 57. They have a two-stage ditch and a sediment basin that acts as a surge pond and slows down the flow out at, their, at the outlet of the system. And then also what was referenced in um, that video was reconnecting the river to its floodplain. And so this is an 80-acre wetland put into an easement that um, kind of acts as a surge, too, for temporary water storage. Um, so our current approach to make this happen, the weavy windy kind of thing, there's a lot of kind of developing a plan, figuring out who's the right people to bring in, and then just kind of fine tuning it more and more um, to create implementation and kind of make change. Uh, we've been meeting the last few years to just, it's a real iterative process when working with people and trying to make plans to adapt to what programs are available, your expertise that's there and um, kind of what's, what are the best opportunities. Uh, so this is what 
a targeted sub watershed map looks like that we've been developing in Freeborn Lake. This is part of their lake reclamation project uh, recommendations. And so there's programs, uh, geographic information system programs called the Agricultural Conservation Framework that spits out kind of what are some, where are your opportunity areas within a watershed and opportunities for grass waterways, some of your highest loading fields that you might want to target for reducing surface erosion and um, slowing the flow on those practices. So at the end of it is a lot of these maps are kind of a template on which landowners do we talk to that will have the most impact. Um, and at the end of the day, this is really what it comes down to is meetings and talking. Having folks who are experts uh, like Patrick Belmont and his crew on uh, developing a sediment strategy and some of the sources that uh, for sediments and other pollutants and then getting farmers together and county commissioners and everybody to just learn and ask questions and target our steering committee members, Paul Davis, to give us the whole dog and pony show of what the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency does to monitor our river systems around here. Um, take students out to check out what a two-stage ditch looks like and alternative ways to um, manage drainage systems and um, represent or talking about throwing the word about our seven recommendations and seeing rain gardens and things that urban communities can also do to kind of uh, treat and manage their stormwater. And then here's our steering committee crew. We just had a meeting. This is back in August to kind of talk about our next steps and have a little celebration that of where we've come and reflection about where we want to go and um, I just love that picture. It's, it's, this, is my fa this is my second family <laughs> in the sewer and trying to figure this stuff out. Um, so these are the people that have helped us along the way and who we've worked the most immediate with right now. Um, Minnesota State Agencies, Department of Health, the Pollution Control Agency, um, McKnight Foundation, thank you guys and Right now we're working with LCCMR and um, our local government's unit with Sika County has been really supportive. So um, if you want to learn more about what we're up to and where we're going and some of our priority watersheds, you can check out our website. We are here in New Richland talking about how water moves through the landscape with a rainfall simulator donated by Fishers and Farmers Partnership. And it was a pretty cool event. So uh, thank you guys. Thank you, Jessica. I think you've captured so well this group of very energized and inspiring citizens that are trying to affect change in the Lesseur River watershed. So now we're going to turn to another regional watershed, the Watton One watershed that Pat mentioned in his talk. And so Dusty Anderson and I will be talking about our journey in that watershed. Thanks, Patrice. <laughs> So we titled this talk um, Leverage Points for Getting More Conservation Adoption in the Watton Wan River Watershed. And I'll explain more about that in a minute. But I just wanted to thank Dusty Anderson, who's worked for the Greater Blue Earth River Basin Alliance. The acronym is JABURBA. Um, and Tyler Grupa, who's also a member of this team from the Water Resources Center. And Paul Davis, who's in the audience, who's, uh, who's guiding our efforts here from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. All right, I know we had a few orienting maps, but I just want to add one more. When we talk about the Greater Blue Earth River System, this map illustrates uh, that watershed. So the Blue Earth River is coming in from Iowa, then the Watanwan River flows into the Blue Earth, later the Sewer River flows into the Blue Earth, and then it, at Sibley Park, it dumps into the Minnesota River, and then the Minnesota River goes downstream, and at Fort Snelling, it joins the Mississippi River, and then that water flows all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. So we're very connected what's going in in this part of the world to downstream receiving waters. So the Lesur River watershed is indicated in blue on this map. So we're turning to talk more about the Watanwan River watershed, which is indicated kind of a greenish color. All right, so this map shows the Watanwan River watershed to, again, to kind of get oriented where we are. If you head west towards Lake Crystal, keep going, Medelia, St. James, Mountain Lake. That's the watershed. Then up north to Lake Hanska and down south 
perch, there's Perch Lake or the community of Truman. So that gives me an idea of kind of the geographic anchoring for the Watanwan River watershed. It's roughly 880 square miles. It's predominantly in agricultural land use, about 86% in ag lands, mostly corn and soybean, and privately owned majority of it. And there's roughly 30,000 people that live in this watershed. All right, so some, just to give you a little more background about how some of these citizen efforts that we've been working on get started. So this is part of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency's framework for trying to address water quality problems in the state. So what they have done is divided the state into the 81 watersheds, and they are slowly cycling through on 10-year cycle, very intensively looking at each one of the watersheds. So. The Lesseur River watershed started their watershed investigation 2008. Watanwan River started their watershed investigation in 2013. And now they are, we're working through, and I'll give you some background information on the steps with this process. But the main reason that we're doing this is reaching out to citizens to help them understand what scientists are learning about these watershed investigations so they can use it in their planning and thinking through for the future of their watersheds and also to inform these watershed restoration protection strategies. So the process we chose to use in the Watanwan River watershed was to really try to disseminate and distill a lot of the data that we have learned about the watershed. The experts like Pat going out learning about these watersheds and how do we aggregate the information, disseminate in a way that people can use it. So another thing that we decided we really wanted to focus on in this journey in the Lesseur was looking at trying to better understand what the community is thinking. How do they connect with water? What concerns them around water? What do they think needs to be done to clean up their watershed? So we have held a lot of meetings similar to what you heard from Jessica in the Lesseur, trying to reach out to people who live in, on the farmlands, reach out to people that live in the cities, and really gather as a lot of information. And once we have also not only understand how they feel about the water and connect with the water, but connect them with the scientific information and then try to figure out what are we going to do about it? What are some action strategies that we could move forward? So we heard a very inspiring um, social science researcher named Ryan Atwell. And he had this concept, he's been very successful in and making affecting change in rural landscapes, getting more conservation. And he said, what you really need to do is try to understand the community, understand the social network of a watershed, and it's just as important as understanding the physical correct connections within and what's happening with these very complex and dynamic physical systems. You also need to understand what's happening in the social systems. So we set out to try to do a better job understanding what's happening socially in these watersheds. And we got intrigued with this idea that he had about leverage points for change. So he said that often if you look very closely, you can find three to six different things that are interacting that could either help to create a barrier or to find opportunities for more change. So this is notion of leverage points. Are there some leverage points that we could be thinking of to get more conservation on the land? All right, so first I wanted to give you a broad overview of the science, which Pat's already talked about. But there's a lot of people studying these systems. So this is a map that shows all the locations in the Watanwan where people have taken water quality samples. So those are the, the green dots or they've done biological monitoring, which is the red dots. All right, so the people are out there um, taking fish surveys, they're looking at macro invertebrates, they're studying the fish and the bugs, and they're trying to understand what's going on with the ecological system. There are also people like Brooke that we saw in the film, Brooke Hacker from the Department of Natural Resources, that is studying how our river channels are. How's the channel shape, form, how's it changing from over the years, and what's the status of the river channels, as well as try to understand the flow regimes in these rivers. 
So as Pat has already talked about, there are many, many concerns that we have the scientists think about in these, in these rivers. The increasing flows, flashy river systems, elevated sediment and, and nutrients. We have some concern around the aquatic, the health of the aquatic systems, greening lakes, and concerns around groundwater. So Dusty and I set out across the watershed, and Dusty did an amazing job interviewing lots and lots of producers all across the watershed. But we met with people in cities, we met with city staff, we met with local government officials, um, soil and water, county, lots of state agencies. We met a host of different producers, bankers, crop consultants, and we held one-on-one, -on -one, we held group meetings, and we really tried to do a more robust effort to find out about the, socials, the social system, the social network, and talking to them all along about, are there some leverage points for change that we could be thinking about in the system to get more conservation on the land? So along the way, we met a host of really inspiring people. People that are great stewards of the land. We had lots of different sizes of meetings, one-on-one, -on -one, small group. People doing wetland restorations, all kinds of things on their land, thinking about um, how they can be really good stewards and controlling the flow of water, treating those pollutants before they leave their property. So many, many local leaders that are doing great things across this watershed. There's also some familiar pictures here. <laughs> We're so lucky to have Pat in our watershed because he's so good at distilling and disseminate very complex scientific information in ways that's understandable. And I didn't know that you were going to be out with all the walleye. It's such a good <laughs> walleye fishery in the Watton one. He sometimes likes to keep that quiet. So now I'll turn it over to Dusty. He'll distill some of the concerns that we heard across the watershed. So as Kim uh, mentioned, we were out talking to a lot of different people um, and through our adventures out through the watershed, we uh, were able to listen and document a lot of um, the feelings of people towards the way the land is being used in the watershed, their thoughts on water quality, um, and just the general thoughts about how the watershed health is in their, uh, their neighborhood. And so we were able to kind of compile a lot of that information and come up with some of the major themes with what citizen concerns were in the watershed. And as Kim mentioned, we spoke to a lot of different people. And so you can kind of see... <laughs> Uh, you know, people in the cities, that urban infrastructure, um, you know, like a lot of our infrastructure in the rural areas, uh, is struggling. And, uh, you know, we're, we get more rainfall, um, we're expanding in some areas, and it's difficult to keep up with that existing infrastructure to handle storm water, waste water, uh, and also our drinking water infrastructure. Um, in some areas, we have some groundwater issues. Uh, we have a lot of really powerful quotes, and that's one up in the corner there, where um, sometimes it's not, um, maybe surface water isn't always in the forefront of people's minds. It's about the groundwater. Uh, and, and, and that truly does make sense uh, to live out in the rural areas. If we don't have groundwater that we can utilize for, for our water supply, um, it would be very difficult to live in, out, out in the countryside. Uh, people that live along the rivers um, have noticed these flashy systems where the rivers seem to bounce up uh, immediately after these rain events. And so we've heard testimony about that in the Lesseur. We're also hearing those same problems in the Watton uh, and, and at the same time, people are noticing how the rivers are, are changing and reacting to those flashy flows where they're seeing their favorite fishing spots kind of disappear uh, overnight, essentially. Um, Another thing we're hearing is, is people uh, kind of feel um, at a loss of, of how to deal with these large rain events when it comes to surface erosion and, and, and keeping their soil in their fields so that they can crop them. Um, some areas are seeing flooding, uh, like the golf course in Medelia, which is a city-owned golf course, which they rely on for uh, you know, some, some city uh, income. And so uh, if they're not able to uh, get 
green fees uh, to, to make some money there, then it, it'll be difficult for that resource to stay open for that community. And of course, um, you know, the land of 10,000 lakes, phosphorus has a great impact on our lakes and, and uh, the greening of those lakes uh, is, is a great citizen concern in the Watton Juan uh, for recreational um, you know, and aesthetic purposes. So we were able to assemble a lot of uh, kind of the local leaders in the Juan Juan River watershed. We identified um, through these different focus groups and through these interviews people that are really motivated uh, and have an interest in these issues. And we, uh, over a series of several meetings, um, we were able to um, put them in a room together and, and, and provide some information for them. So we brought in several uh, scientists to, to help distill the information of the watershed, all the water quality, biological data, the geomorphology data. We were able to um, bring in some people to talk about farm economics uh, and of course also um, have them digest some of the social uh, results from our interviews. And what we came up with was really interesting. So we allow the people to, to hear all this information. Uh, they start talking to each other and they come up with some really great ideas. Uh, a lot, a lot of really great ideas. And so our challenge then was how do we take all this information and compile it into some of those leverage points that we can utilize uh, to, to move some of our, our um, solutions forward to try and attack some of these citizen concerns. And so we asked our group to prioritize. And here are some of the things that our group prioritized, some leverage points for change where we can, we can um, uh, attack some of those citizen concerns. And so a couple is surrounded around conservation outreach. And so um, really the big goal here was, was getting uh, local conservation professionals out in the landscape to interact with uh, local farm producers and landowners. And so one kind of really interesting idea that came out from one of our, our citizen champions was that uh, this idea of a conservation consultant. I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, you know, a crop consultant. Well, these crop consultants are very engaged with farmers across the landscape and, and engage with them throughout the, the whole year. You know, if a problem comes up, the, the crop consultant's there. Well, we want to have that same impact with landowners and, and growers in the watershed when it comes to conservation. If something comes up, we want to be the first person that they call and maintain that good contact. And of course, the other thing that comes with that is, is education. So this other really great idea about this traveling conservation circus. What if we had a trailer with a lot of different educational outreach materials that we could take to different locations across the watershed and we could just kind of pop up and do some demonstrations and, and, and interact with people. Um, another area was to uh, target conservation and GIS, uh, geographic in information system mapping. So utilizing this new technology to identify areas on the landscape, maybe for water storage or where there has the uh, uh, potential there to be resource concerns uh, maybe with nutrients and sediment. And uh, we've actually been partnering with the Water Resources Center here at MSU Mankato to advance some of those things. So a great resource there for the Watt and Juan. Soil health has been uh, a topic of conversation uh, throughout much of Minnesota and, and nationally. Uh, and so you know, utilizing some, some resources in the area like Faribault County and Freeborn County who have active soil health teams that are out working with growers to try and, and promote some of these more sustainable practices to building the soil biology and, and more sustainable agricultural practices. And so we have some NRCS um, folks in the Watton that are working towards that. Uh, but also what comes with that is clarifying the economics of some of those different practices. It's important for uh, uh, to make money with farming, right? It's a business first and foremost. And so to, to be able to clarify how some of these different practices are going to have an impact on the pocketbook is extremely important. That was identified by our citizen group. There was a big focus on marginal lands. Farm the best, buffer the rest. So um, making it easier to, to, to identify those properties that aren't doing well and, and then what is it going to take to get that land set aside? What does that landowner need 
when it comes to resources or uh, financially, what does that landowner need to set that land aside so that it serves a better purpose in protecting our water and our environment and maybe helping wildlife habitat? So there's a couple of, uh, we had a couple of speakers come in that, that have some tools to be able to do that. And then uh, one last thing was, was focusing on ditch improvements. Uh, we kind of heard that a little bit from a previous speaker here today. Um, ditch improvements, that sounds, uh, the, the term improvement is, focuses more on, on drainage rather than the environment. So a, a ditch improvement is increasing the amount of water that is going through a, a said ditch. So um, if we could identify some areas where these ditch improvements are proposed and then, and then help the landowners in that area identify areas that could potentially store water so that we can at the same time you know, make their agricultural lands more productive but also mitigate downstream impacts of increased water flow. And so um, all these things together, we're going to continue working with our citizens and, and advancing these action steps that have been identified through the group and it takes strong partnerships with both the universities and the state agencies and, and it takes a lot of work within the soil and water conservation districts and the counties uh, and elected officials. It, it, it really is a, a, a big effort. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to thank the panelists uh, for some very insightful information and very in, very informative presentations. Let's have a round of applause for the panelists. <laughs> I, I also know, and, and I'd be remiss if I didn't introduce uh, the senior vice president and provost for academic affairs, Dr. Marilyn Wells, who may want to come up here and uh, say, say a couple of words before we get into uh, questions from the audience for our panelists. I'd just like to thank everyone for being here today, as well as our panelists, as we continue to look at ways that the university could be a, a leader and a key stakeholder in the agriculture, food, and natural resources area throughout the university. Thank you, Provost Wells. Now, uh, turning to questions from from the audience, uh, Patrice is is going to take a microphone uh, to you if you have questions, and please direct your questions uh, to the panelists. Any questions, Dr. Martinson? Well, can you there? Uh, thank you all for, for your presentations. I, I very much appreciate it. Um, I just had a, a, a quick question, I guess, in some sense, on um, solutions that might be possible when we look at, uh, as was mentioned, that the drainage systems are largely what's leading to uh, the nitrogen phosphorus in particular. I know Jessica mentioned uh, water, water storage systems as a possible solution. Uh, I've also heard a lot about controlled drainage uh, systems that might be in place and I'm wondering, I didn't hear that mentioned so much, I'm wondering is that a viable option? Is it cost prohibitive? Are there other issues that might make that less uh, conducive to say southern Minnesota solution? Well, I, I'm assuming when you say controlled drainage you mean controlling the water table level within a subsurface uh, okay. Yes. Well, um, I think there are some challenges with that. Uh, retrofitting fields with um, those gate control structures is difficult. So you almost need to um, have the correct pattern tiling in the field that allows for the minimum number of gate control structures to be installed. Um, and as you can imagine, there aren't too many locations in South Central Minnesota that aren't already tiled uh, in some form or another. Um, and um, tiling uh, practices in the past haven't necessarily um, installed subsurface drainage tile in a way that allows us to just install gate control structures. So that is a challenge. Um, at the same time, there's also added management to that practice. Um, you know, the time that we want to store water is in the spring when we're getting these massive rains, but unfortunately that coincides with the time where we're trying to get out there to do field work. 
So I think there are some challenges with that practice. Um, it certainly could help uh, in some ways, but uh, having a large impact, I, I guess I don't really see that. Um, yeah, I share a similar uh, sentiment as Dusty and closer. Another challenge is some of the landscape challenge um, suitability sites. So we have, like in Blue Earth County, some more steep sloping fields that might not be uh, accommodate controlled drainage structures as effectively as you might in a flatter field. And so it's just limitation of the existing tile and then uh, landscape um, with the steep slopes. So, yeah. Questions? Matt? Yeah, well, I guess the big question is that I mean, you see less, you see less than uh, um, a third of the year where there's green crops on the land. And then we have a majority of the year where it's just bare earth. I mean, what's, I mean, crop, uh, lower tillage or cover crops have been shown to help with this. What's preventing uh, us from encouraging farmers from maintaining those practices? I don't know if you've come across it, but I'm, I'm curious because you've talked to a lot more citizens than, than I have now. So there, there's a lot of um maybe misperceptions and added management to changing your operation to include um, equipment you might not necessarily have or um, thinking about timing a little differently and figuring out what, it's, just, it's another management challenge that not people, people aren't really required to consider. And so um, there's folks slowly working their way into it and there's also another <laughs> perception that you can't grow cover crops north of I-90 because we have a colder climate and um, just kind of information dissemination that needs to happen and working with people one-on-one -on -one and figuring out how can, what's the best scene mix, what's the best um, planting time and termination and make them as successful as possible. So just investing resources in that um, kind of focused effort. And I think some people have characterized like, the interest in soil health as kind of a wave that's coming up from the south. And so we are really hopeful that some of the soil health, changes in soil health, if you have a really robust soil with lots of organic matter, you can store a lot of water. And that's one of the key things that we need to be thinking about in these watersheds. So we're hopeful that that can be a part of the solution strategy and there's gaining interest. I think we had kind of a powerful aha moment at one of the Lesueur River watershed meetings when Pat Duncan sent a, a producer in the one of the citizen leaders said I'm trying to conserve my soil during this this spring time frame and at the same time that presentations like Pat saying most of the pollution is running through the system during that same spring time frame and so we wanted to try to show a chart of the um, a lot of researchers studied like what are the ways we can get reduced nutrients in these watersheds as part of the nutrient reduction strategy and what was compelling with the findings with a lot of the modeling and analysis is that cover crops do a lot to prevent both, they, they can make a huge difference in terms of pollution reduction overall. So we're encouraged with this interest in all these citizen groups and trying to figure out how do we focus on the soil health and figure out ways to get more cover crops in the landscape. Yeah, to uh, continue on to your question there, Matt, as it Matt? Um, the uh, research shows that a combination of no-till and uh, cover crops uh, has a lot of benefits, um, all the things we've been talking about today. But we've discovered in, in Iowa we have about 50% of the farm ground is uh, owned by people who don't farm it. So <clears throat> if you're renting farm ground, uh, you're not going to do much as far as converse, conservation uh, if your landlord doesn't care or, you know, Obviously, you're thinking short term, can I pay the rent this year and make a little? Um, so the, one of the key things in Iowa is to get landlords and renters together on conservation, uh, whether it's splitting the cost on, on uh, cover crops or uh, in, instituting some edge of field practices that uh, reduce the, the, the um, nutrients flowing into the watersheds. 
So I would suggest that that should be a major uh, area of emphasis is trying to get landowners educated, whether they live in LA or Paris or wherever they live. Uh, you know, there's a lot of folks out there living in Florida that own farms in southern Minnesota. Um, but I, I think that's critical. Um, on my farm in Iowa, I, I'm the landowner. I work with my neighbor, and we've done a lot of, a lot of good work together. Uh, in fact, um, Friday we've got some students from Iowa State coming out to look at what we're doing. So we, um, we think that's uh, a good way to go, get those landowners and renters together on conservation. Thank you, Lee. Uh, so you had said that you held a lot of one-on-one -on -one and group meetings, Dusty. Uh, I was wondering if any of that raw or aggregate data is available anywhere from those sessions? I've learned a lot more about qualitative data than I wanted to. Uh, it's, it's by no means quantitative. Um, we um, were really uh, grateful to, to tap into the resources at the University of Minnesota with May Davenport and Amit Pradhananga that allowed us to kind of structure some of that, um, our interviews to try and answer some of the questions we wanted to answer, um, but then also take these responses and code them in a way that allows us to make connections and kind of draw some conclusions. Um, we are working together to <clears throat> generate some outreach materials uh, that will be available to the general public soon um, that uh, w really compiles a lot of what we heard in more, more detail. Um, the uh, say I, I don't know that we plan on making the raw data available um, just for the fact that you know these are open conversations we have them sign consent waivers that we allow we are allowed to utilize that data but um, you know sometimes personal information comes up in these interviews and so uh, you know protecting the identity of the people and, and ensuring that their views and opinions aren't connected with them personally is a, a priority of ours in that. But um, if, if there is some interest in some of the information, we'd be more than happy to work with you to get you the information you need. Okay, we need to add that. We just appreciate your question because I think we have a whole another level of appreciation for social science. The importance of of really doing robust social science and investigation, and that it's equally as important as the physical science part in this work. I think we are learning that um, it's one thing to really understand how a watershed works and these very complex dynamics within a system, but it's equally challenging to try to understand the social system and and how these two can fit together. I think is where a lot of great change can happen. So we're, we are humbled by <laughs> but, but, but the important work of social scientists um, as well is in trying to, how do we fit these pieces together to affect change in these systems? Next question. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you very much for this uh, forum. Uh, I'm sorry I came in a little bit late, so I, but I was seeing the, some of the uh, pictures on the wall, and we talked there, and I noticed tiling and and flow and ditches. And my question is, uh, if someone would know this, um, how much? Tiling. I mean, I would imagine that the ditches that you, that we talked about, that are talked about, uh, that are county ditches or public ditches, they, we must know how many miles of that they are and and what is the flow in them. But how about the tiling that goes into those ditches? Do we know? And I hear I hear things like there's a hundred thousand miles of new hundred thousand miles of new additional tile each year, and uh, in Minnesota, and, and maybe that's a small number I don't know, but it sounds like a lot of tile. And if flow and quantity is an issue, my question is, do we know how much is being put in, and how is that regulated? There's not a public documentation of the amount of private tile that goes in on a field. Um, public tile and public drainage systems, they have to record that because the drainage authority, which is commonly the county commissioners in our area, has a record um, there. But 
there is one uh, soil and water office out west that makes sure to monitor all the pub the drainage tiles that go in there. Um, there's not a standard, so you'd have to go to get permission from the landowner and then talk to their contractor or tile excavation company to track it. So long story short, um, we don't know how many is going in there. There is a model that was created to estimate tile density within a watershed based off of soil types and land uses and um, slope and uh, some data that the Water Resources Center had collected back in 2007 to map, uh, actually map tile densities and go out and talk to landowners within uh, sampled watersheds. And they use that to correct it and they kind of have an estimate across the state, but there's not a good hard number available. Any other questions? Just to add to that, landowners, um, you know, it's it's fairly easy to to put in new tile. Um, you essentially have to go to your local USDA office and fill out a form, um, kind of stating what you intend to do and where you intend to do it. And there's a determination made just to make sure that you're not impacting any wetlands with your tiling. So. Uh, as a local, as a, as a landowner, you have a lot of freedom to install additional tile if you so choose to. Thank you. We have time for one more question. Okay, well, uh, once again, I'd l like to thank the panel uh, for very informative uh, discussion and, and presentations. And uh, special thanks to Kimberly Musser for moderating the panel and uh, the work that she did in organizing uh, the panel. Uh, Don and Becky Wiskoski, thank you very much for coming and sharing your story. Uh, about uh, uh, about some of the experiences that you have had uh, living on the river. Uh, Pat Baskfield, thank you for uh, talking about regional water quality. Uh, Jessica uh, Nelson, thank you for uh, sharing your expertise and uh, the s seven steps to watershed health. Uh, and uh, Dusty Anderson, uh, thank you for all the points that you made, uh, as well as the Wantawan uh, River leverage points uh, and the con conservation issues. Uh, and let me ask for a round of applause thanking them for coming today in the panel for sharing your information. Okay, and I'd also like to thank everyone for coming today, taking time out of the middle of your day. I know how busy you are, both people who have come from inside the university and outside the university. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for your interest in very important uh, topics. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.